Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered together in fellowship today on the 25th of the seventh month on the Zadok Dead Sea Scrolls calendar as we reckon it. And it is also October 9th, 2021. We're continuing with the Recognitions of Clement, which is a wonderful book. It's really the preaching and teaching of Shimon Kepha, or what they call Simon Peter. And we are currently on book one, chapter 36. Kepha's reiterating history from creation to their current times. And they had just finished with the Exodus account. So now we take up Kepha's account here. And this is how he's speaking about the allowance for sacrifice or Zebach for a time. It says, when meantime, Moshe, that trustworthy and wise steward, perceived that the vice of sacrifices to idols had been deeply ingrained into the people from their association with the Mitzrayim, and that the root of this evil could not be extracted from them. He allowed them sacrifice, but permitted it to be done only to Yahuwah, that by any means he might cut off one half of the deeply ingrained evil leaving the other half to be corrected by another, and at a future time, by him namely, concerning whom he said himself, a foreteller will Yahuwah your Elohim raise unto you, whom you will hear even as myself according to all things that he will say to you. Whosoever will not hear that foreteller, his inner being will be cut off from his people. And as we go, you'll get a little more detail about the, the things that caused, like the Mitzrayim, how their false worship started. We'll learn about it was magic that instituted the, or that turned men's heart away from the truth and what was the foundings of idol worship and, and sacrifices to them. But that's later on. So I'll leave it for that time. However, if you are familiar with Alexander Hislop's Two Babylons, then the information that's in there directly correlates with the things that we'll also be reading in here and how the, the errant religions and the false worship started. To make a long story short, Satan was the anointed cherub that covers in the Shamayim. He read the scrolls that were there, the, the Shamayim tablets as they're called, and he would have been familiar with the, his creation, the history and what would happen. And he has perverted things and brought in errant things through the world in, diver in diverse means to pervert the true message that was always going to be coming from our father through our Mashiach. And that's why you see before he came, pagan things that are reminiscent of stuff that's in scripture, but it's twisted. Anyways, to get back on, on point here. It says, in addition to these things, he also appointed a place in which alone it should be lawful for them to sacrifice to Yahuwah. And all this was arranged with this view, that when the fitting time should come, and they should learn by means of Yahushua, that Yahuwah desires mercy or loving kindness and not sacrifice, and that they might see him who should teach them that the place chosen of Yahuwah, in which it was suitable that victims should be offered to Yahuwah, in his chokmah, and that on the other hand they might hear that this place, which seemed chosen for a time, often harassed as it had been by hostile invasions and plunderings, was at last to be wholly destroyed. And when he came, he, he did say that. He mentioned that he, he doesn't desire sacrifices, but obedience, and that the dwelling would be destroyed because they weren't listening, right? And in order to impress this upon them, even before the coming of Yahushua, who was to reject at once the sacrifices and the place, it was often plundered by enemies and burnt with fire and the people carried into captivity among foreign tribes, and then brought back when they betook themselves to the loving kindness of Yahuwah, or mercy of Yahuwah, 
that by these things they might be taught that a people who offer sacrifices are driven away and delivered up into the hands of the enemy, but they who do mercy and righteousness are without sacrifices freed from captivity and restored to their native land. But it fell out that very few comprehended this, for the greater number, though they could perceive and observe these things, yet were held by the irrational opinion of the vulgar or the common. For right opinion with liberty is the exclusive right of a few. And this is what you see throughout history, where it was only a select few that held the truth and carried it down. Moshe then, having arranged these things and having set over the people one Yahushua to bring them to the land of their fathers, himself by the command of the living El, went up to a certain mountain and there died. Yet such was the manner of his death that till this day no one has found his burial place. When, therefore, the people reached their father's land, by the providence of Yahuwah, at their first onset, the inhabitants of immoral races are routed, and they enter upon their paternal inheritance. Now, I want to point out something. You, if you remember... Yahushua Mashiach was said to be the foreteller that's coming like unto Moshe in all things, and him we should listen to. Moshe's burial place was not found after he was dead. It seemed like he was rejected, and yet he was accepted as his most trustworthy. These are all different themes in there that are reminiscent of what our Mashiach would walk out as well. I just want to point that out if anyone wasn't familiar with it. There's many more different parallels there that are mentioned in a variety of places, but that's also one of them. This is, to back up, this is, at their first onset, the inhabitants of the immoral races are routed, and they enter upon their paternal inheritance, which was distributed among them by lot. For some time thereafter, they were ruled not by kings or sovereigns, but judges, and remained in a somewhat peaceful condition. But when they sought for themselves tyrants rather than kings or sovereigns, then also the regal ambition, or with regal ambition, they erected a hekel or temple in the place that had been appointed to them for prayer. And afterwards, through a succession of immoral sovereigns, the people fell away to greater and still greater impiety. But when the time began to draw near that what was wanting in the Mosaic institutions should be supplied, as we have said, and that the foreteller should appear of whom he had foretold that he should warn them by the loving kindness of Yahuwah to cease from sacrificing, lest they might suppose that on the cessation of sacrifice there was no remission of sins for them, he instituted mikvah or immersion by water amongst them in which they might be absolved from all their sins on the invocation of his name and for the future following a perfect life might abide in immortality being purified not by the blood of beasts but by the purification of the hokma of yahuwah which is yahushua Subsequently, also, an evident proof of this great mystery is supplied in the fact that everyone who, believing in this foreteller who has been foretold by Moshe, is immersed in his name, will be kept unhurt from the destruction of war that impends over the unbelieving tribe. Now, this part, if you have ever heard of me talking about the ancient history of Caledonia, you'll see many examples of that very, very thing. If you're familiar with the time of the Maccabees, in particular, where the people are gathered together and Antiochus is trying to get a horde of elephants to trample them. 
While they were all innocent as doves, they were protected miraculously multiple times from that. In many different ways, his people as a body politic collective not doing evil is protected from harm while the immoral are given up to destruction. And that very same pattern is also seen in the war of the Yahudim by Yahusuf or Flavius Josephus, where he records the events of the destruction of Yarushalayim. When Cassius brought the armies of Rome before them and then left, that was the sign that our Mashiach said, when you see the armies surrounding Yarushalayim, know that its destruction is nigh, therefore flee. And after that happened and they removed themselves, that was when his body people left and they were they avoided the destruction in that same way multiple times through history his people are protected for doing the same thing and if you get the ancient history of caledonia example after example you'll see of that very thing happening both while they're outside of their own promised land during the i think it was three generations that they had to go through at the fall of troy the righteous were protected when they left crete or Carthaginia, they call it, but when they left Crete, the righteous were protected. And again, when they left Gaul, and then multiple times when they were doing the right thing to collectively, they're miraculously protected from the destruction that happens to the unbelieving. That's the same thing we can look forward to as well. This is from the destruction of war that depends on over the unbelieving tribe, right? However, you see that you have to be immersed in his name to do that. And that was another thing that we had mentioned earlier before we were on camera. We were talking about the martyrs through history. They didn't have his name in truth, but they were otherwise perfect. Or if there was any remnant of evil in them. In the Shepherd of Hermas, it talks about those that were going to be martyrs. They're having to suffer for the things that they had done in their life, even though they were accepted. This was their, their price for entering into the reign. To be made perfect like, like him was a great gift because they otherwise would not have been able to be delivered. But they patiently endured whatever came upon them in love, which is the goal of every believer, what we're enjoined to do. He came to show us that, right? But right here, it, it's another witness. If he's immersed in his name, he will be kept unhurt from the destruction of war that impends upon the unbelieving tribe and the place itself. But that those who do not believe will be made exiles from their place and kingdom or reign, that even against their will, they may comprehend and obey the will of Yahuwah. That's the same as saying he is trustworthy even when we are not. He'll do what he said, even if we're not being obedient. The advent of the true foreteller, Yahushua, chapter 40. This thing, therefore, having been prearranged, he who was expected comes, bringing signs and miracles as his credentials by which he should be made manifest. But not even so did the people believe though they had been trained during so many ages to the belief of these things. And not only did they not believe, but they added blasphemy to unbelief, saying that he was a gluttonous man and a belly slave, and that he was acuted by a demon, even he who had come for their deliverance. To such an extent does immorality prevail by the agency of evil ones, so that but for the hokma of Yahuwah assisting those who love the truth, almost all would have been involved in disobedient delusion. Therefore he chose us twelve, the first who believed in him, whom he named Shaliachim, or sent ones, what we commonly call apostles or emissaries, and afterwards other seventy-two most approved taught ones, that, at least in this way, recognizing the pattern of Moshe, the multitude might believe that this is he of whom Moshe foretold, the foreteller that was to come. And just so you remember, you had Yaakov, who had the 12, who had 72 that were brought into the land. And in the same way, you had Moshe, who 
gathered the 12 and then had the 72 or the elders that were chosen to help him. And then the, the same pattern that they're talking about is when our Mashiach came, he was the one who anointed the 12 and then sent out his other taught ones, the 72, so that they can see the pattern that was being done and believe him, if not for what he said, then for the signs themselves, right? And the miracles that he was doing. But someone may say that it is possible for anyone to imitate a number. But what will we say of the signs and miracles that he wrought? For Moshe had wrought miracles and cures in Mitzrayim. He also, of whom he foretold that he should raise up a foreteller like unto himself, though he cured every sickness and infirmity among the people, wrought innumerable miracles, and preached ageless life, was, her was hurried by immoral men to the stake, which deed was, however, by his power turned to good or tobe. In short, he was suffering, or while he was suffering, all the world suffered with him. For the sun was darkened, the mountains were torn asunder, the graves were opened, and the veil of the Hekel, or temple, was rent, as in lamentation for the destruction impending over the place. And yet, though the entire world was moved, they themselves are not even now moved to the consideration of these so great things. But inasmuch as it was necessary that the nations should be called into the room of those who remained unbelieving, so that the number might be filled up that had been shown to Abraham, the preaching of the Baruch Malkuth of Yahuwah is sent into all the world. On this account, worldly spirits are disturbed, who always oppose those who are in quest of liberty and who make use of the engines of error to destroy Yahuwah's building, while those who press on to the esteem of safety and liberty, being rendered braver by their resistance to these spirits and by the toil of great struggles against them, obtain the crown of safety, not without the palm of victory. Meantime, when he had suffered, and darkness had overwhelmed the world from the sixth even to the ninth hour, as soon as the sun shone out again and things were returned to their usual course, even immoral men returned to themselves and their former practices, their fear having abated. For some of them, watching the place with all care, when they could not prevent his rising again, said that he was a magician, Others pretended he was stolen away. Nevertheless, the truth everywhere prevailed, for in proof that these things were done by Elohim's power, we who had been very few became in the course of a few days, or Yamim, by the help of Yahuwah, far more than they, so that the Kohanim at one time were afraid, Least it be that by the providence of Yahuwah, to their confusion, the whole of the people should come over to our belief. Therefore, they often sent to us and asked us to discourse to them concerning Yahushua, whether he was the foreteller whom Moshe foretold, who is the ageless Mashiach. For on this point only does there seem to be any difference between us who believe in Yahushua and the unbelieving Yahudim. And right here is a second witness to the fact that they were expecting our Mashiach to be enduring or to be ageless. Another one is in the scriptures, right in the renewed covenant, where the people are gathered to him and he, they say to him, We've heard that when the Mashiach endures forever, who is this son of Adam, right? And then another witness to that is in the Dead Sea Scrolls where it, it quotes Melchizedek as the Mashiach that's foretold by Daniel who will be coming, that will be cut off in the midst of the week. 
and he is the ageless Mashiach, they actually quote when they're talking about the coming of Melchizedek, that Daniel was fulfillment of him, saying the one that was going to be cut off, the Mashiach that came, is him, for one. And when they're quoting Yeshayahu, and they're talking about the year of Yahuwah's favor, they put the year of Melchizedek's favor, calling him Yahuwah, which is also mentioned throughout these writings and the other ones, where he was literally given the name of the Father. Right here it says, for on this point only does there seem to be any difference between us who believe in Yahushua and the unbelieving Yahudim. But while they often made such requests to us, and we sought for a fitting opportunity, a week of years was completed from the passion of Yahushua, the kahal or congregation of Yahuwah that was constituted in Yerushalayim was most plentifully multiplied and grew, being governed with most righteous ordinances by Yaakov, who was ordained overseer in it by Yahuwah. All right, so challenged by Kayafa. It says, but when we 12 Shaliachim or sent ones on the Yom of the Pesach had come together with an immense multitude, and entered into the kahal of the brothers, each one of us at the request of Yaakob stated briefly in the hearing of the people what we had done in every place. While this was going on, Kayapha, the high Kohen, or the Kohen Hagadol, sent Kohenim to us and asked us to come to him, that either we should prove to him that Yahushua is the ageless Mashiach, or he is to us that he is not. And that so all the people should agree upon the one belief or the other. So the desire was to have iron sharpen iron and to come to one accord. And this he frequently entreated us to do, but we often put it off, always seeking for a more convenient time. Then I, Clement, answered to this, I think that this very question, whether he is the Mashiach, is of great importance for the establishment of the belief. Otherwise, the high Kohen would not so frequently ask that he might either learn or teach concerning the Mashiach. Then Kepha, you have, rightly, or you have answered rightly, O Clement, for as no one can see without eyes, nor hear without ears, nor smell without nostrils, nor taste without a tongue, nor handle anything without hands, so it is impossible without Yahushua to know what is pleasing to Yahuwah. And that's the same, without the word, we can't know to, what to avoid. We can't know what to do that our creator desires unless we learn from him or from someone he sent it's another way of putting it is no man can know the mind of a man much less we can't know the mind of our creator but we do have the mind of mashiach because he's come and given us comprehension this is and i answered i have already learned from your instruction that this true foreteller is the mashiach but I should desire to learn what the Mashiach means or why he is so called that a matter of so great importance may not be vague or uncertain to me. So he's asking about the title Mashiach itself, the name or the word. Then Kepha began to instruct me in this manner. When Elohim made the world as master of the universe or creation, he appointed chiefs over the several creatures, over the trees even, and the mountains, and the fountains, and the rivers, and all things that he had made. As we have told you, for it were too long to mention them one by one. He set a messenger as chief over the messengers, a ruach over the ruach oath, or spirit over the spirits a star over the stars, a demon over the demons, a bird over the birds, a beast over the beasts, 
a serpent over the serpents, a fish over the fishes, and a man over men, who is Mashiach, Yahushua. But he is called Mashiach by a certain excellent rite of obedience. For as there are certain names common to messengers, or sorry, common to kings, as Ahasuerus among the Persians, Caesar among the Romans, Pharaoh among the Mitzrayim, and then later Ptolemy among the Greek pharaohs, right? So among the Yahudim, a Melech, which should be two words, A and then Melech, is called Mashiach. And the reason of this appellation is this, although indeed he is the son of Yahuwah and the beginning of all things, he became as man. Him first Yahuwah anointed with that oil that was taken from the wood of the tree of life. From that anointing, therefore, he is called Mashiach. From there, moreover, he himself also, according to the appointment of his father, or Abba, anoints with similar oil every one of the obedient when they come to his Malkuth, or reign, for their refreshment after their labors, as having got over the difficulties of the way, so that their light may shine, and being filled with the Ruach HaKodesh, they may be endowed with immortality." But it occurs to me that I have sufficiently explained to you the whole nature of that branch from which that ointment is taken. But now also I shall, by a very short representation, recall you to the recollection of all these things. In the present life, Aharon, the first Kohen Hagadol, was anointed with the composition of anointing, which was made after the pattern of that ruachni, or spiritual ointment, of which we have spoken before, the one taken from the tree of life, right? He was sar, or prince of the people, and as a sovereign, or melech, he received first fruits and tribute from the people, man by man, and having undertaken the office of judging the people, he judged the things clean and things unclean. But if anyone else was anointed with the same ointment as deriving virtue from it, he became either sovereign or foreteller or Kohen. If then this temporal favor compounded by men had such efficacy, consider now how potent was that ointment extracted by Yahuwah from a branch of the tree of life when that which was made by men could confer so excellent dignities among men. For what in the present age is more splendorous than a foreteller, more illustrious than a Kohen, more exalted than a sovereign? To this I replied, I remember, Kepha, that you told me of the first man that he was a foreteller, but you did not say that he was anointed. If then there be no foreteller without anointing, how could, he, how could the first man be a foreteller since he was not anointed? Then Kepha smiling said, if the first man foretold, it is certain that he was also anointed. For although he who has recorded Torah in his pages is silent as to his anointing, Yet he has evidently left us to comprehend these things. And this is important because there's some things that are inferred in scripture, not specifically mentioned. It's mentioned in the hidden writings, but you can see the evidence in scripture if you are thinking rationally and reasoning it out. And this is, ex- this is explaining that very thing. It says, for as if he had said that he was anointed, It would not be doubted that he also, or that he was also a foreteller, although it were not written in Torah. So, since it is certain that he was a foreteller, it is in like manner certain that he was also anointed, because without anointing he could not be a foreteller. But you should rather have said, if the ointment was compounded by Aaron, 
by the perfumer's art, how could the first man be anointed before Aaron's time? The arts of composition not yet having been discovered. Then I answered, do not miscomprehend me, Kepha, for I do not speak of that compounded ointment and temporal oil, but of that simple and ageless ointment which you told me was made by Yahuwah, after whose likeness you say that the other was compounded by men. Then Kepha answered with an appearance of indignation, What? Do you suppose, Clement, that all of us can know all things before the time? But not to be drawn aside now from our proposed discourse, we will at another time when your progress is more manifest explain these things more distinctly. Then, however, so he's telling, he's basically redirecting Clement to something because it's not, it's not necessary for him to know or to get into that when they're talking about a different subject, right? He's going to go over it when he's more fully aware of, of the things that he needs to know. He says, then, however, a Kohen or a foreteller, being anointed with the compounded ointment, putting fire to the altar of Yahuwah, was held illustrious in all the world. But after Aaron, who was a Kohen, another is taken out of the waters. I do not speak of Moshe, but of him who, in the waters of immersion, was called by Yahuwah his son. For it is Yahushua who has put out by the favor of immersion that fire that the Kohen kindled for sins. For from the time when he appeared, the anointing has ceased by which the office of Kohen or foreteller or sovereign was conferred. His coming, therefore, was predicted by Moshe, who delivered Torah of Yahuwah to men. But by another also before him, as I have already informed you. And he's saying that the illusion of his first coming was seen in Yaakov and in what he had done in his life. He therefore intimated or hinted that he should come humble indeed in his first coming, but splendorous in his second. And the first indeed has been already accomplished since he has come and taught, and he, the judge of all, has been judged and slain. But at his second coming, he will come to judge and will indeed condemn the immoral, but will take the obedient into a share and association with himself in his Malkuth or reign. Now the belief of his second coming depends upon his first. For the foretellers, especially Yaakov and Moshe, spoke of the first, but some also of the second. But the excellency of foretelling is chiefly shown in this, that the foreteller spoke not of things to come according to the sequence of things. Otherwise, they might seem merely as wise men to have conjectured, what the sequence of things pointed out. And he's about to explain what that meant, right? But what I say is this, it was expected, or it was to be expected that Mashiach should be received by the Yahudim to whom he came and that they should believe on him who was expected for the deliverance of the people according to the traditions of the fathers but that the nations should be adverse to him, since neither promise nor announcement concerning him had been made to them. And indeed, he had never been made known to them even by name. Yet the foreteller, contrary to the order and sequence of things, said that he should be the expectation of the nations and not of the Yahudim. And so it is. For when he came, he was not at all acknowledged by those who seemed to expect him, in consequence of the tradition of their ancestors, whereas those who had heard nothing at all of him, both believe that he has come, and hope or expect that he is to come. And thus, in all things, foretelling appears trustworthy, which said that he was the expectation of the nations. The Yahudim, therefore, have erred concerning the first coming of Yahuwah. 
the, the first coming of Yahuwah, speaking of our Mashiach, not the Father, but he was called by the Father's name. This is something that you'll see more in here and throughout the common scriptures once we start going over what the placeholders are about. And just for the record, so anyone wants to look into it, if you look up what's called Nomnia Sacra, which is Latin for sacred names, you'll find the information about the placeholders used in the Greek manuscripts for about 1400 years or 1300 years, or sorry, 1100 years from about 300 AD to 1400 AD and the coming of the Textus Receptus. But in the Greek manuscripts before the Textus Receptus, they would use placeholders, two or three Greek letters with a line over them for the name of our father, for the name of the Mashiach, for the word man, upright, a pull or execution stake, Mashiach, Shemaim, Ruach, Elohim, and the derivatives of it. And anytime they would be talking about our creator or the Mashiach, they would use the placeholders for talking about his Ruach instead of the spirit. But when they talked about it in other places, they would just use the regular word for Greek because it didn't matter. When it was talking about his things, it was set apart and unique. It was separate and not to be mixed. And so they used the Hebrew word in place of the, the placeholder there. They would not use the Greek. So once, you, once we get into that, you can see the placeholders. And then all throughout the Renewed Covenant writings, he's called by the Father's name. Every, all over the place, all the letters, all the, all the endings and beginnings of it. Even in the good news accounts in the book of Luke, when the messengers are announcing to the shepherds, they say that today or this Yom has been born in the city of Dawid, a deliverer, Mashiach Yahuwah. And again, at the end of Luke, when they're going, it says, and they did not find the body of Yahuwah, Yahushua. That's in one of the good news accounts itself. There are, I think it's in the book of Yahukanon as well, but I don't know about the other two. However, all throughout the epistles, every one of them, he's called by the Father's name. And that's something that we don't see unless we know about the placeholders. Here, though, and in places outside of it, like the Dead Sea Scrolls with the coming of Melchizedek, as I mentioned, that he's directly called Yahuwah, or they'll put like Melchizedek when they're quoting Yeshayahu. And they're talking about the year of Yahuwah's favor. They say the year of Melchizedek's favor. So right here again, you can see that the first coming of Yahuwah is mentioned, which is our Mashiach. And on this point only, there is disagreement between us and them. For they themselves know and expect that Mashiach will come, but that he has come already in humility. Even he who is called Yahushua, they do not know. And this is a great confirmation of his coming that all do not believe on him. He, therefore, has Yahuwah appointed in the end of the age, because it was impossible that the evils of men could be removed by any other, provided that their natures, or sorry, that the natures of man's race were to remain entire, i.e. the liberty of the will being preserved, meaning your free choice to do good or evil, even after you are a believer. This condition, therefore, being preserved inviolate, he came to invite to his Malkuth, or kingdom, his reign, all righteous ones, and those who have been desirous to please him. For these he has prepared unspeakable tov things, and the Shemaim city Yerushalayim, which will shine above the brightness of the sun." For the habitation of the Kodeshim, or set-apart ones, but the unrighteous and the immoral, and those who have despised Yahuwah, and have devoted the life given them to diverse immoralities, and have given to the practice of evil the time that was given them for the work of righteousness, he will hand over to fitting and adequate vengeance. Our Mishiach had said, 
before I came, they have no sin. And now that I have come, they have no excuse for their sin. And that's why after he came, the light of the world was made. And then Leviathan and Behemoth were created. The beast out of the sea and the beast out of the earth. The ones where we will bear our inequities for not taking what he said, right? But the rest of the things that will then be done. It is neither in the power of messengers nor of men to tell or to describe. This only, it is enough for us to know that Yahuwah will confer upon the Tob or good an ageless possession of Tob things. When he had thus spoken, I answered, if those will enjoy the Malkuth or kingdom of Mashiach, whom his coming will find righteous, will then those be wholly deprived of the kingdom who have died before his coming? Meaning all those that had been born and lived and died before the, the first advent of our Mashiach. What about them, right? And this also goes along with what about us until his second coming. But then Kephas says, you compel me, O Clement, to touch upon things that are unspeakable. So far as it is allowed to declare them, I will not shrink from doing so. Know then that Mashiach, who was from the beginning and always was ever present with the obedient, though secretly, through all their generations, especially with those who waited for him, to whom he frequently appeared, meaning every time they saw Elohim and lived, every time someone saw Yahuwah and spoke with him, that was our Mashiach, right? But the time was not yet that there should be a resurrection of the bodies that were dissolved. But this seemed rather to be their reward from Yahuwah, that whoever should be found righteous should remain longer in the body or at least as is clearly related in the writings of Torah concerning a certain righteous man that Yahuwah translated him. And this would be Hanok that is recorded in the book of Genesis or Bereshit. Also in first Enoch, you can see that. And another witness in the book of Yobelin. This is in like manner. Others were dealt with who pleased his will that being translated to paradise, they should be kept for the Malkuth. This is speaking of Eliyahu, Baruch, and Ezra at the very least. And you can find these Eliyahu in the common scriptures in 1 Kings and 2 Kings right there. You can find Baruch in 2 Baruch where it talks about him being taken and kept to the consummations of the times. And you can find information about Ezra in fourth Ezra. And then all of these are also reiterated by Irenaeus. And he gives the distinction on the different rewards for the different levels of fruit bearing of the people, whether it's a hundred fold, which is the Shamayim is your dwelling place. The 60 fold, which is the garden of Yerushalayim or the garden of Eden, my apologies or the 30-fold, which would be the Shamayim Yarushalayim. But right here, let's continue. It says, but as to those who have not been able completely to fulfill the rule of righteousness, but have had some remnants of evil in their flesh, their bodies are indeed dissolved, but their ruach oath or spirits are kept in good and baruch abodes that at the resurrection of the dead, when they will recover their own bodies, purified even by the dissolution, they may obtain an ageless inheritance in proportion to their tobe deeds. And therefore, Baruch are all those who will obtain to the Malkuth of Mashiach, for not only will they escape the pains of Gehenna, but will also remain incorruptible and will be first to see Yahuwah the Father, and will obtain the rank of honor among the first in the presence of Yahuwah. And again, the distinction between Yahuwah the Father, because there is a difference, and no man can see him in the flesh and, and, and exist. 
The only times anyone's ever seen him, like Daniel saw him, it was in a vision. Yeshiyahu saw him in a vision. Gaz the seer saw him in a vision. Yahukanon in Revelation saw him in a vision, but they saw the Father and our Mashiach in the Ruach. And in the same way, Hanok, when he in the book of First Enoch, if you read that, he was taken bodily into the Shamayim and turned into a messenger. And it was in the in the body, in the state of being like the messengers that he was brought into the presence of the Father, where he was able to perceive him. He didn't look upon him. No one is able to accept our Mashiach, but he was able to perceive him and to see that his garments were seven times brighter than the sun, which he's the one who dwells in unapproachable light. It's mentioned by Shaul. So these are all concepts that we can find hidden plainly spoken of, but not fully comprehended unless you're able to study these things out. But here we go, we'll take pause for a moment.